In lessons 7 and 8, we will look at the topic of Christology. Lesson 7 will be broken up into three parts and will cover and comment on the Christology of the Damascene. And then lesson 8, will, we will, in the first lecture, finish up our treatment of the Damascene and then move into uh, more speculative matters with respect to the order of intention. Uh, that is, in what place do we find Christ and Mary in terms of God's plan and purpose for the world. And this will bear upon how we understand the Incarnation in relation to original sin and the fall. So in this first part, that is Lesson 7, I hope to just give an overview and some brief commentary on the Damascene's treatment as the Damascene sums up and presents a, a coherent synthesis of the Greek tradition while keeping in mind in Lesson 8 we will look more closely at the theology of St. Maximus the Confessor, um, touching upon also uh, St. Gregory Palamas, and then in the West, Blessed John Duns Scotus with respect to the position of Christ in the plan of God, with respect and special attention to Mary's Immaculate Conception and the place of Mary as the Theotokos, and how she relates in the order of the divine plan to the Incarnation and the Incarnation to God's total purpose. So, beginning, we might call this an introduction to Christology ad mentum the Damascene, that is, according to the mind of St. John of Damascus. And before we begin, it would be helpful to know how St. John sees how the incarnation, that is, Christology, can be spoken of. And he says, Christology can be broken up into four basic genres. And this passage is found in actually book four of his De Fide Orthodoxa chapter 18 <clears throat> and the four basic genre are we can speak of and these are these refer to uh, modes of speaking about Christ and this is interesting because uh, these modes of speaking in a sense encapsulate within distinction the various aspects and moments of the word in the eternal heart of the Father, in the in the place that the Incarnation held in the intentions of the Father with respect to creation, and then of course in the economy of salvation, that is in creation, focused and terminating in the union between the Word and human, human nature as such. And so this fourfold division in a sense unites what the uh, Greek fathers called theologia proper, that is, God in himself, and also the economia, that is, the created order founded and rooted in the incarnation. So just briefly, let us run through these four divisions then. We can speak of <clears throat> Christology with respect to prior to the union, that is, the incarnation, the union between the word and the assumed human nature. We can speak of Christology in terms of in the union itself. That is, we can discuss what this union is. We can discuss then, and this is, and this second point really comes to bear on the personal and natural, that is the hypostatic constitution of the God-man. What, what, what Christ is metaphysically in being both God and man in one person. <clears throat> Then the next mode, the third mode, can, we can, can be considered um, according to after the union. That is, in terms of what are the effects of the union with respect to the word, the divine nature, if there is any effects, and also the human nature. That is, what are the effects of being a divine person, hypostatically united to a divine person for human nature as such. And also this could include uh, Christ's uh, <clears throat> gifts of knowledge of prophecy, of, of miraculous power, of authority over the created order, all of these things can be considered of in virtue of 
the union itself that is in the union, founded in the union, that is the incarnation, but consequent to the union in its effect. So in the union is the first essential moment constituting who the God-man Christ is, and after the union are the effects in creation and in the assumed human nature of Christ himself. And then finally, after the resurrection, and this has to do with the perfect complement, that is the full perfection of the assumed humanity in being assumed, or not being assumed, but in ascending into heaven and then being seated at the right hand of the Father, that is, given a position of authority, and power over the created order as a divine person, but as a divine person united to all creation in and through his assumption of human nature. <clears throat> so St. John Damascene begins then this treatment of uh, Christology by reviewing and that is in book three by reviewing the the divine economy first in the way that we understand that economy in terms of temporal history that is beginning with creation and then focusing upon the fall and then moving to the incarnation as the final term or result of um, a long pedagogical history wherein God was bringing mankind back to himself through his ordained ministers in order to prepare them for the coming of the God-man himself. So first, John then talks about sin and its effects, and we just covered this briefly, um, but at greater length in the previous lecture on uh, the fall and sin. And so the first thing John lists is the fall resulted in a loss of grace. Secondly, it broke communion between Adam and his progeny with God, and it introduced toil, corruption of both the natural order, that is the physical order, and the personal personal order, that is, um, the physical order is ordered to decay and dissolution, and the moral order, that is, the our free choice is weakened, such that we can no longer, naturally of our own power, seek to know and to love God properly, and we're prone towards sin, prone towards choosing against the will of God, and ultimately this sin resulting from this loss of grace, this broken communion and the corruption of mind and body that ensues results in death. In an ultimate sense, if it's not rectified, spiritual death, eternal death, and in the temporal sense, physical death, that is dissolution, the separation between soul and body, and the death of all physical entities because of man's sin. The second point, however, is that God didn't leave us in this state. And in fact, as we will see in the next, in the lectures from Lesson 8, that in fact Christ was the purpose of God's creation. And because God first loved Christ, and Christ was the son of Mary, who was the descendant of not just the Jewish people, not just the Abrahamic people, but Adam himself, Christ out of love, God out of love for Christ, and thus for Christ's family, his human family, um, will to save and raise up and redeem humanity because of his prior love and intention for all creation in Christ himself, and that is in the incarnation and the immaculate conception. But St. John Damascene, following a more chronological or historical approach, uh, specifies that God from the beginning was moved by pity and love. Having seen man fall into this state of degradation, this loss of communion, and terminating in death, as uh, the Apostle James says, sin when it is finished brings forth death. God, moved by pity and love, established a pedagogical order through various historical and geological events um, such as the flood, such as the Tower of Babel, such as using and employing angelic ministers, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as a sign, other signs and wonders, such as uh, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud that led the Jewish people or the Israelites out of, out of Egypt and through the desert into the Promised Land. Um, wars, 
uh, signs of God's providence leading the children of Israel, holding them together as an integral identity in order to bring forth the, the God-man, the Messiah. Also, the giving of the law and the prophets. These all were understood by St. John Damascene, and rightly so, to be not just negative punishments, although they certainly were this, but primarily as positive indicators, positive signs and markers to assist the Jewish people, and, and in virtue of the Jewish people and their unique position as ministers to the world, to the entire world, bringing them to a point at which they were disposed to receive and accept the incarnation, that is, the Messiah. And then finally, all this pedagogical movement throughout history and uh, revelation uh, terminates in God himself taking on created nature, in and through taking to himself the crown of created nature, that is, human nature, in the incarnation. And St. John Damascene says this incarnation is the one new thing under the sun. That is, after the initial creation, the incarnation is something new, something, something unanticipated, at least clearly, by man prior to its event. And also, in some sense, uh, the first fruit of creation. That is, what God intended in the very perfection of the assumption of a human nature to a divine person. This first fruits means that the incarnation was the best thing and the first thing in creation itself. So thus it comes thus although the incarnation comes at the end of a sacred history of a of a given people, the, the Israelites, this incarnation itself was the entire purpose of creation and God's special providence leading the people of Israel to seek to seek him and him alone in the face of various false religions and false philosophies. So the new thing under the sun is perfect man and perfect God in one subsistent person one subsistent divine person. So that after having given this pedagogical account, this brief account that is perhaps even in St. John Damascene reminiscent of the covenantal history of the people of Israel that uh, St. Stephen the first martyr of the church gives in the book of Acts. The Damascene then moves directly into the conception of the word and the incarnation. And interestingly enough, we find that elements of the creation story and the divine pedagogy, that is the divine covenantal history of the old covenant people, are recapitulated. That is, the same themes, the same actors, if not actors personally, the same types of actors reappear in the narrative of the incarnation. So as angels ministered to the people of Israel, so in the angel Gabriel appears to the virgin and greets her. And the virgin obviously functions as an antitype, not only of Eve, but also the antitype of the unfallen earth that God used to create the first man from. So not only is Mary the complement of the new Adam, she is also the source of the new Adam, as was the virgin earth. So the angel Gabriel appears to the virgin, and we have the fulfillment of the mission of the woman, Eve, in the Virgin Mary's ascent in her obedience, but we also have the reappearance of the theme of pure flesh, that is, pure created nature, being used as the single source to draw out the man, that is, the second Adam. And so the angel Gabriel then greets Mary uniquely as full of grace in the Greek kekaratomene, which is a perfect past participle, and it's difficult to translate, but I think an adequate translation clearly is hail full of grace, or hail, hail, one 
having been filled with grace and perpetually filled with grace. It, it implies an accomplished act, but an accomplished and continuous action. So Our Lady is simply in her person, redounding in her nature, grace-filled. That is, she is like she is like God. She is the perfect handmaid of the Lord. But when the angel greets her, she's troubled at this greeting and questions both what manner of greeting is full of grace, and moreover, the angel's prophecy that she should conceive and bear a child raises further issues because she knows not man. And there's been some speculation and debate on what this particular phrase means, but it, it seems to indicate by the nature of her question that she's not planning on being married. So thus, her betrothal to Joseph um, was indicative, perhaps, of a prior commitment to a unique marriage, one that was not to be consummated in um, sexual union between husband and wife. Otherwise, the question is, how can this be? How can I can, can how can I conceive a child when I know not man is a silly question because it seems to me that if she is betrothed at the time of this greeting, the answer is quite obvious. She's going to be married. But the angel then takes her question quite seriously and he prophesies to Mary that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that will overshadow Mary. And, and thus, the unique source, the generative source, is not the seed of a man, but God himself through the mediation of the Holy Spirit. And thus, in virtue of the generative activity coming first from the Father, acting upon Mary's own re reproductive capacities. The source of Christ's humanity is uniquely Mary, and the source of his person is uniquely God the Father. That is, God the Father in eternally generating the Son, and then the Holy Spirit applying his power to create human nature through the cooperation of the virgin's, quote, pure blood in order to pr produce a, a, a man-child with no human father but one divine father. And so thus, this is why St. John Damascene can say that the first fruits of our nature is God made man. That is, this is the very best of what nature can offer God when God acts in a unique and hypostatically assuming way in and through a virginal mother. We have perfect fecundity, but perfect chastity and integrity, resulting in the perfect personification of a created nature, a created nature subsisting in a divine person. And thus, what follows from this, and this is extremely important for uh, St. John Damascene, uh, flowing out of Chalcedon and the fifth ecumenical council, um, is that what we have is not one compound nature. There is not one new thing that is partly God, partly man, or a composite of the two, but one hypostasis, one person in two natures. And in this sense, we can preserve God as naturally infinite, perfect, simple, and man as finite and complex and compounded. And this is a key point because the unity of the incarnation is not in a unity of two natures coming together, but rather two natures subsisting in one hypostasis. That is, one person that doesn't have any direct implication for nature, one person subsisting eternally as the word, and thus as the word being a termination, as we've mentioned in uh, the first, I think it was lesson three, the, the termination of uh, the divine nature in the person of the word, but then a human nature being created and from the first moments, very first instant of its existence, also terminating in not the divine nature of the word, but in the word itself as a subsistence.
And this is very important because, as St. John Damascene states, and he's repeating the common heritage of the Greek fathers, especially St. Maximilian Kolbe, but also as will be picked up and made a centerpiece of his theology later in St. Bonaventure, the failure to distinguish adequately or clearly between nature and person is the root of heresies concerning the Trinity and the Incarnation. So this is an important consequence of the Incarnation, the union between God and man in the person of the Word is this, maybe we can speak of a compound hypostasis, that is, two natures terminating in one hypostasis, but not two natures converging to form one nature that is neither totally God nor totally creature. That is man. So then the Damascene begins to discuss Christ's two natures. And so he first notes that the two natures, that is man and divinity, are united substantially. But substantially, if we look back at the handout I provided of Latin and Greek terms, substance and subsistence, subsistence that is usia and hypostasis, hypostasis uh, can be used equival uh, equivocally. And so we have to be very careful because what St. John Damascene is not saying is that the two natures come together to form one new substance. No, they're not united in that way. When he says substantially, he simply glosses this substantial union is that the union between the two natures is real. It's not uh, a quasi-Nestorian understanding of uh, the pantomime horse, where you have two distinct persons with two distinct natures operating in this inexplicable synchron uh, synchronicity on the one hand, nor is it the monophysite or monothelite error, which would hold that in the incarnation, the entirety of human nature was not assumed, unchanged, in its perfection with its with its own inherent powers, but that really the incarnation um, entailed a, a melding or a mixing of the divine and human. So it's important to say then that um, St. John Damascene by this use of substantial or substantially with respect to the uni unity of Christ's two natures is he's just affirming its reality. And later theologians who will wrestle with this topic of what in the world does this unity, this real substantial unity between divinity and humanity in terms of their nature, what does that actually mean? And there have been, to be honest, no adequate analogies to unpack and to decipher that riddle. And so in this sense, we can say with uh, St. John Damascene, with St. Bonaventure, with St. Maximus and Blessed Duns Scotus, that the incarnation itself represents a deeper mystery perhaps than even the Trinity in terms of understanding the nature of that union. And uh, in further classes, I'm sure this, the analogies for a substantial union, the various ways that we can uh, use images and comparisons to begin to understand the union between the divinity and humanity on the level of nature, um, will be further explored. But in simple fact, there is no adequate analogy to, to unpack or to render this mystery intelligible. So as I've already mentioned, uh, the, the Damascene is clearly rebutting and rejecting and correcting the, the monophysite error. On the one hand, he is affirming that the Word shares the simple nature of the Father. The Word and the Father and the Spirit are identical in nature, but really distinct in persons. And moreover, the human nature assumed by the word that is subsisting in the word also shares the compound nature of the mother. Compound meaning composed of soul and body. Distinct substances that come together to form a single composite nature. That is of two distinct powers. Matter, spirit, body, soul. 
Um, so thus the incarnation doesn't result in a third thing, identical to neither the simple nature of God the Father nor to the compound nature of the Theotokos. No, he's identical in nature to both because he possesses both natures in their perfection and in their perfection of operation. So then he clarifies the word Christ then ultimately doesn't refer to the man properly or to the divinity properly. Rather, Christ primarily refers to the hypostasis, that is the person, the person who has a human nature and a divine nature, both subsisting in the one hypostasis of the word. And this is, and then he gets to, and this is where the, uh, the importance of the distinction between nature and person a distinction, by the way, which perhaps logically, but that is a doubtful and disputable question, but de facto, historically, and probably in virtue of the limitations of our knowledge and our will, and thus our psychology, the distinction between nature and person only arose and perhaps could have only arose in virtue of the incarnation itself. Prior to that point, there was no clear distinction between nature, <clears throat> either, especially though, with respect to concrete individuals and person, that is hypostasis. And this is why we go back uh, to the ambiguity and difficulty of terms with respect to uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem and the Monophysites, the Nestorians, um, even the Arian heresy, there was a dis there was a, a difficulty distinguish nature from person, and thus a difficulty in understanding how Christ could be one person and two natures, or God could be three persons in one nature. But then this but this error of heretics in confusing nature and person is actually the seedbed, the first premise for all of their Christological and Trinitarian errors and heresies. <clears throat> so thus, if the Monophysites are wrong, and Christ bears both the nature of his father and his mother in his hypostasis, then we have one single divine person, that is the Word, having a created and an uncreated nature. In this respect, Christ is absolutely unique. Thus. As the Damascene notes, there is no common species or form of Christ because it's one divine person assuming one divine nature. There is no other incarnations that are going to occur or have occurred. Possibly they could occur, but according to the writer of the book of Hebrews, God in these last days has spoken a final word through his son. And thus we know, even if it is somehow logically possible that multiple incarnations occur, or perhaps one person assume multiple individual natures, this won't happen. So as the Damascene then notes, de facto, there is no common species or form Christ. There is just the one Christ, the one God-man, the one person having two natures. And this is then, then the Damascene then says, we don't have a compound nature, God, man. We don't have this theandric composite, but we do have two united, two natures united in one compound hypostasis. And again, this notion of compound hypostasis is kind of like his use of substantial. A hypostasis is absolutely simple. It is indivisible. That's the very notion of person, per se una through himself one. It's incommunicable, it's imparticipable. So when the Damascene says compound hypostasis, he's not referring to a hypostasis that somehow has two parts that come together to form one new thing in addition or on top of realities independent prior to the hypostasis. He's referring to the convergence or the fact that two natures, two distinct natures terminate in this one indivisible, incommunicable, and independent person, hypostasis. So by compound, then, the compound is referring back to the natures which terminate and not properly modifying the notion of hypostasis. And what the Damascene is operating with, again, he's operating from within a mystery, 
a mystery that's ultimately inexplicable in terms of Aristotle's four causes. No, there's something prior, something personal, personal action that is singular that must be the ultimate explanation. And that ultimate explanation then is mysterious. It has to do with the life of the Trinity itself, pure being as such, as three persons in one nature. So as the two natures are substantially united without change, so are is the hypostasis compound in so much as two distinct natures terminate in the one hypostasis. And then finally, we have this notion then of communication of properties by virtue of the unity of hypostases possessing two natures. And here's where this term again shows up in the Damascene, that term perichoresis. And I will And I will just read from the Damascene uh, from a slightly different translation than the one we're using. I'm using the old uh, Philip Schaff edition, which uh, translates a few terms a bit differently, but is less useful in a certain sense because it lacks the uh, philosophical chapters in the Book of Heresies. It just has the De Fide Orthodoxa. But quoting the Damascene in Book 4, Chapter 3, Book 3, Chapter 3, excuse me, uh, the Damascene writes, Moreover, the word appropriates to himself the attributes of humanity. Thus, in the hypostasis, the word, because the hypostasis doesn't imply anything directly or essentially about nature, it has to do rather with the person operating in and through and united to a nature, the word can thus appropriate himself the attributes of humanity. Now, obviously, we wouldn't appropriate the attributes of humanity to the divinity, which terminates in the word, but rather to the word in which the humanity terminates, which happens to be the same for both the divine nature and the human nature. So going on, the Damascene writes, For all that pertains to his holy flesh is his, and he imparts to the flesh his own attributes by way of communication. And this is in the Greek rendered kataton antidoseos tropon in a manner of giving over or communication in virtue then quoting the damascene again in virtue of the interpenetration of the parts and this in the greek is rendered diatain ace alela ton meron perichoresin so in virtue of the perichoresis of the two natures this in existence this inseparable unity while being absolutely and perfectly inseparably distinguished. So going on, in virtue of the inner penetration of the parts one with another and the oneness according to hypostasis, and inasmuch as he who lived and acted both as God and man, taking to himself either form, both forms, and holding intercourse with the other form, was one and the same. Thus the, the same person possessed both forms of the divinity and the humanity united inseparably in the person of the word and the divinity interpenetrating and energizing the humanity in such a way that the humanity then takes on the characteristics of divinity in both human attributes and perfections and divine attributes of perfections are predicated equally of the word but not equally of each other. So then naturally, the Damascene moves to the communication between the two natures. <clears throat> this, this, um, the manner in which the two natures relate in their operation. So in the first place, he knows that essence, that is essence, substance, or nature, and hypostasis, or person, are different. Essence is the common species, in Greek eidos, of which the subsistences, or hypostases, are members. So in the one Godhead, there is one common essence communicated to and possessed in infinite simplicity between the three persons. And in created nature, there is a one essence, there is the nature or common species of humanity, which 
terminates or is individuated in a given hypostasis. Well, if the given hypostasis is finite, that is, doesn't, deter, doesn't terminate in a divine person, the result will be a human person, a human finite hypostasis. But if the species of humanity is assumed and thus terminates in a divine person, it will still be the natural common species of human nature, but the natural common species not terminating and subsisting in itself, but terminating and subsisting in the person, the divine person. And thus, the, the first ground, the ultimate explanation of the existence of this particular human person, if it should terminate in, in a divine person, which in the case of Christ does terminate in a divine person, the ultimate source of the existence of this given human nature is divine. And thus we can say that this human being, because he terminates for his subsistence, that is, he subsists as a divine person, is a divine person, not a human person. And so then, given this distinction between what is common and then what is specific in terms of hypostases being members of a given species, there's a threefold use of language when speaking of nature and person. First, there are terms that can refer to nature or essence exclusively. That is, infinity, um, divinity, well, that's not such a good example, infinity, um, the divine being, uh, divine essence, all of these refer to the divine property pertaining to the nature of God. Because you can say the Father is infinite in virtue of the divine nature, but you cannot say the Father itself is infinite as a property of the Father, because then that would predicate a, pers a perfection of the person that then would be distinct of or distinct from the nature. And this is an important distinction, and perhaps a bit abstruse, but the point is is that the divine persons themselves cannot imply perfections of the divine nature. Otherwise, each divine person would have a perfection distinct, an essential perfection distinct from the other divine persons, and thus you couldn't have one simple being, one infinite being, one God, equally the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So person itself doesn't imply this when speaking of the person as distinct from the essence, it doesn't imply divine perfections. It's only in virtue of the divine person being a termination of the divine being, that the divine being, that the divine person, excuse me, is predicated of with respect or in terms of all the divine properties. Then the second way of speaking is we can for, refer either to essence or hypostasis, the second way of speaking about um, the distinction between nature and person. And this example is quite easy when we, when we say God. Well, the term God can refer to either God the Father, as is very typical in our prayers, and also in uh, Scripture, or it can refer to God as the divine being, as the Trinity as such. And so such terms can refer to either person or essence. I mean, person or, yeah, that's right, person or essence. Another example would be man. We could be referring to mankind as a species, a common eidos, which all members of that species um, instantiate. Or we could be referring to man as this man, this man Peter, that man Paul. And then finally, certain terms refer to hypostasis exclusively. And this would be, for example, the Word, the Father, the Spirit. Those refer exclusively to a hypostasis. When I say Peter, Paul, or Mary, those refer to individual hypostases of human nature. Or if I say Christ, I'm referring to the one hypostasis having both a divine and human nature. So such terms pertain to the hypostasis exclusively. And the context then has to come to bear on how we use and interpret theological language and biblical language with respect to this question of the distinction between nature and person. 
And naturally, this distinction will then have implications for prayer and contemplation, as well as for holy images. And we'll get into holy images, hopefully, uh, a bit more next week uh, by looking at the Damascene's treatment of it in the, 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 uh, the exposition of the Orthodox faith, and perhaps um, peeking over at his uh, in defense of the divine images. But some of the implications for prayer and contemplation definitely have to do with when we pray to Christ, we can actually glorify his humanity because his humanity is divine insofar as it terminates in a divine person. So in his human nature, he is divine because this human nature subsists in a divine person, even if we don't predicate infinity and simplicity and necessity to his human nature. And so in a sense, we can pray to the man Jesus simply because he is a divine person and we're not praying to his nature, we're praying to his person, because obviously all prayer is ordered towards persons. It's intentional and interpersonal. And then obviously holy images then would imply there would be implications for we're not praying to the material that goes into making up the image, but rather the image is, is serving as a focus and a locus of attention that mediates for us between our person and the person to whom we're we're speaking. So on the one hand, then, this distinction between nature and person is what allows us to then navigate how we understand ascribing true worship, that is, latria, to the humanity of Christ, and then also how we, in the use of icons, can distinguish between the nature of the icon in terms of its material cause and the term or referent of the icon in terms of its, the person to which it is referring. And thus there are certain rules that, for predication, uh, that we must follow when speaking about Christ. First of all, we don't attribute human qualities to the divine nature and vice versa and then secondly these are basic rules secondly we must see how in terms of praying to christ in his humanity it's in virtue of christ's divine personhood that his humanity then becomes a worthy object of worship and and veneration and then this will um apply with the proper modifications to the entire cult of saints. We pray to the saints in virtue of their personhood, and we pray to their persons because their persons have been fulfilled or suffused and transformed by the divine energies. So in a sense, in praying to the person, asking for their intercession, we're also giving and primarily giving glory to God for his action of perfecting these human persons through participation and infusion, so to speak, of the divine energies, which then transform the mode in which these human persons operate. And then also, we would have to distinguish between the worship that is due God, that is, God is worthy of being worshipped just because of who he is, that is called latria, and then the worship that is attributed to praiseworthy people, in and through whom, and on their own parts, have cooperated with God and whom God has acted upon. We offer them dulia, that is, a reverence in virtue of God's, their relationship to God and God's action with them. But we don't worship them as being intrinsically and inherently worship worthy of worship because they are divinity itself. And then, in the Incarnation, um, if the Incarnation is a union between a human nature and a divine nature, well then there clearly can be only two natures. There's not one nature, there's not three natures. There's divinity, nature and hypostasis, the divine nature common to Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but one hypostasis, the divine nature as terminating and subsisting in the Word. Thus, in Christ we have 
personal properties and origins, the personal property of sonship and that of being begotten, having his idea, his origin in the Father. So we have in the divinity, simplicity and perichoresis. And then thus this forms an analogy, this simplicity and perichoresis, it forms an analogy between theology and the economy. We can look at the nature of the Godhead in his triune being and begin to understand, well, how does the incarnation mirror that in the economy of salvation? And then, as I've said before, the incarnation is in itself a mystery beyond all understanding. When we say compound hypostasis and when we say substantially united, we are not fully clear on what we're talking about because there are no created analogies that see two natures in one hypostasis <clears throat> in, this, in this unique way. So the Damascene simply says that the two natures in the one hy com compound hypostasis are united in something like the three hypostases and one essence, almost in a sense in, a rever in an inverse way where we have three persons in one essence, we now have two persons, two essences in one person. It's kind of like a, an inversion, but there's something similar. If it's possible on the one hand, it might be possible, and in fact is possible on the other. And then finally, an important thing, and this will come, this will come to the fore in later chapters, is the question is asked whether, whether number indicates something about unity and separation. And interestingly enough, um, and I think rightly so, uh, the Damascene says number in and of itself doesn't indicate essential unity or separation in itself. Unity and separation are not through number. So if we say that there are three persons in one nature, the three doesn't imply a division or separation between the natures. So thus we can say God is one essence in three persons, and vice versa. If we can say one person in two natures, we have to then think about the referent of the two, what the two is separate or indicating difference in. And so the unity then is founded in a different place than the distinction. And thus when we say the God-man is one person in two natures, we are not indicating where, just by that statement, where the separation is and where the unity is. We have to further reflect upon the ground of unity being the hypostasis and the division or distinction being the different natures. And so we can have a true unity and a distinction in the presence of number and number thereby indicating difference of some sort. But it doesn't have to indicate quantifiable or quantitative difference, but it can indicate that. So because what is common, that is the essence, is included in each particular hypostasis, in the case of the word, the entire divinity is implied when Christ, hearkening back to an earlier slide, when Christ is spoken of. That is, the essence is predicated of the hypostasis. So when we say the word, we are implying, or the, we say the word Christ, we say we are saying the divinity and also the humanity. And this is because each hypostasis, each individual of a given species, has the entire nature of what of what of which it is a member and this again is hearkening back to the Damascene's discussion in the philosophical chapters in which I covered earlier is that an individual of a species has everything essential to that species and so the entire nature that is the nature in terms of its essence and its powers and operations but not accidents is included when we speak of a hypostasis it's a hypostasis of God. It's a hypostasis of man. In Christ, we have the hypostasis being of both 
In Christ, we have the hypostasis being of both God and man. Thus, in virtue of the Son, that is the word assuming a human nature, the entirety of the divine nature is implied as well as the entirety of the human nature as a species. And thus, because it was only one hypostasis assuming a human nature and uniting a human nature to itself, the Father and the Spirit did not assume human nature except with respect to the common activity of the entire Trinity in creating and sustaining everything that is not itself. So in the power of creating the, create, the, the, the human nature that is assumed by the word, the entire Trinity is an operation together and the action is appropriated as flowing from the Son, through the, from the Father, through the Son, and terminating in the Spirit's activity and overshadowing the Virgin. And so thus, in creating from the pure blood of the Virgin the human nature, the entire Trinity is oper in operation. However, in the existence itself, that is, in the termination or subsistence of that existence, that human nature terminates exclusively in one divine person. So just as in the birth or the conception of any human person, the entire Trinity is an operation bringing that human person into existence, yet that human person doesn't terminate or doesn't, we don't say that that human person is a divine person and its existence is ultimately explained by being hypostatically united to a divine person or to the divine nature, so also in the incarnation, that is in the creation of the human nature which is assumed by the word, we say the whole trinity is an operation, but that human nature isn't subsisting in the entire trinity, rather that human nature is subsisting in a single person, the word. And thus the word is the ultimate ground for its existence, even though the creation and sustaining of that human nature is the common action of the trinity. So then, also then, uh, we can say a bit about the hypostatic union is, uh, <clears throat> interestingly, the, the Damascene then notes the locus of union, that is the point of contact, so to speak, between the human nature and the word, that is how the human nature terminates in the word, is in virtue and through the mind. And so in this sense, we see these themes of mediation. The union is between the, the created nature and the word is through the through the mind, the higher spiritual faculty. We have the theme of mediation. We also have the theme of in and through the mind, the microcosm, that is human nature in its entirety of matter and spirit, is in a sense summed up and ordered towards and connected to the word. But the microcosm being a microcosm, naturally of the macrocosm, all of creation is summed up through that created human nature of our Lord and through that created mind, memory, intellect, and will is brought to bear in terminating in for its existence in the person of the word. And then finally in this micro, this theme of, through these themes of mediation, microcosm and macrocosm, we see then all creation being summed up and reordered, that is recapitulated, in and through the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his ineffable union with the word himself, and in virtue of the word, the divine nature itself, in a unique and personal way. And thus we find that the ultimate purpose of creation is union in Christ with God in a personal manner, but ultimately looking forward towards the resurrection as the perfection of that human nature and the fulfillment of the purpose of God in creation. That is, in bringing creation in the person of Christ through his created mind, through his created nature, to sit at his right hand, the Father bringing Christ to sit at his right hand, to be in a position of divine yet human authority over all creation. And thus, in uniting himself with human nature, Christ unites himself to a mediatory nature, that is human nature, bringing together matter and spirit. He 
instances the microcosmic macrocosmic structure and relation between creation writ large and the mini creation in the soul and the summing up and ordering that in human nature and then the recapitulation that is the summing up under one heading all of reality so in virtue of his incarnation he assumed our nature and by assuming our nature he assumed all the elements in kind of the created order that is the 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 physical elements and the spiritual elements and he links us to himself in our nature and through that linkage in the resurrection he raises our nature and by raising our nature he raises our hypostases but as personal we have to act through our hypostases in accordance with the will of God or against the will of God thus the resurrection posits the assumption of all creation and primarily the assumption and resurrection of human nature but those human persons in that resurrection have to either cooperate or resist the headship of Christ according to their hypostatic action and this is all coming straight from St. Maximilian Kolbe. So thus, I mean, St. Maximus the Confessor, excuse me. Um, and thus, we find the importance of the distinction between common nature and distinct hypostases. In virtue of assuming nature, Christ assumed all men in all reality, ordering it in and through himself. But as distinct hypostases, we are resurrected to eternal malbeing or eternal well-being. We will all achieve eternal being in the resurrection, but it's only in virtue of our personal free disposition to Christ that will determine how that resurrection is received and, and experienced by us for all eternity. And thus in um, the incarnation, we get back to this strange notion of the compound hypostasis of the word. The word qua hypostasis is eternal, simple, and mutable. The word is a divine person. And because the word is a divine person, the word has a divine nature. And in virtue of his nature, he is eternal, simple, immutable, etc., infinite, etc. But in the incarnation, he causes flesh, that is the Trinity, causes flesh through what you might say the quasi-sacerdotal instrumentality of the Virgin. That is, the Virgin is transmuting her flesh in a virginal way, in an utterly unique way, and in virtue of her purity, her immaculate conception, the Virgin, the Virgin's pure blood is transmuted into the flesh of the human nature of the Son of God. So thus, in bringing about the incarnation in herself, Our Lady, that is the Theotokos, is engaging in a more perfect act of transubstantiation, a more perfect Eucharist, because she's not only bringing present Christ sacramentally, and really, she's bringing Christ, Christ present historically, and really, not under the symbol of signs, but in the flesh itself. And so thus, because she is uniquely a virgin mother, the Theotokos operates uniquely as a quasi-sacramental instrument that then becomes the archetype of all priestly sacramental action in and through the liturgy. And thus, in the incarnation, that is, in the creation of the human nature of the Son of God, we have the result of one compound divine hypostasis that bears the properties and energies or activities proper to each nature. And again, the Damascene is correcting the monophysite and monothelite errors, which would deny, on the one hand, the full nature and thus properties and energies. But on the other hand, with monothelitism, it would affirm that the human nature was assumed, but it wouldn't allow for all the energies proper to that human nature to have been assumed. Thus, monothelite, one will, not two, thus denying the proper energy of voluntary power to the created human nature. And so with Ciro, then, the Damascene can say that there is one incarnate nature of the word incarnate. Incarnate emphasizing that 
this hypostasis is both man and word. Man implying creation of the flesh and word implying the divine person, which already then implies the divinity itself. So even though Cyril's one incarnate nature of the word incarnate sounds monophysite, the Damascene attempts to finesse that understanding in order to bring back Cyril's language itself into an orthodox um, context and allow for an orthodox manner of understanding. And so finally we can say that Christ, in virtue of this compound hypostasis, is holy God, that is, he is by nature, as the divine word, God. He is completely God. But as to the whole Christ, that is, Christ in his compound hypostasis, he is not only, or he is not as a whole only God. He is both God and man. So we can say that holos refers to the nature, where whole, Christ, refers to the person. And again, we end up at this important decision. between nature and person. And then finally, um, for this lecture, we can, we can say that our earlier reflections on the fact that number does not of itself imply separation, unity, or separation, we can then ask the question, are the two natures continuous or discontinuous? Well, of course, they're non-continuous because they're not part of the same reality. They don't have, as for example, in a line one single line with divisions marked or intervals marked within that line. It's not one entity. And so in that sense, the natures are non-continuous. But remember that number for John implies neither unity nor separation. That is ontological or essential separation. In some sense, even in, in a continuous number, like in a line again, we could, we could say that we have one line and multiple units within that line, but it doesn't separate the line itself. And in fact, there's perhaps no real separation even between the units. It's more uh, a distinction of reason rather than a real distinction, implying independence of each individual segment. <clears throat> but rather than, number signifies a difference or a distinction and applies in when counting things, that is one, two, three, four, five, it applies in so much as two things are in some way different. So if we can specify a difference, we can then in some way number them. That's, that's the Damascene's point. <clears throat> and so he seems then here, um, the Damascene seems to be holding to what is called um, by later philosophers, I believe, oh boy, I believe it's Leibniz. Um, he seems to be, hold what is, to be holding what is called the identity of indiscernibles. That is, if you can't tell a difference between two different things, they must be the same thing. And this seems, on the one hand, um, as, you know, when speaking of the Trinity, you can't tell a difference by essence between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all the same essence. So there is a kind of identity because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as nature, are indiscern indiscernible. However, um, with respect to uh, this notion then applying to the divine energies and the interrelation between God and, and creation, uh, Pavel Florensky, Florensky, the great uh, Russian polymath, has some interesting comments uh, because he says perhaps this notion of the identity of indiscernibles isn't really universal and doesn't perhaps hold in every case because on the one hand if we have the divine energy of say charity infusing us we cannot distinguish qualitatively between the charity infusing us and the charity that is inseparable as an energy from the divine essence and so there's some instance in which indiscernibles that is this divine energy in me or you or in the saint and this divine energy which is inseparable from God are indiscernible. And so thus this identity of indiscernibles may not hold. However, I think that Florensky is making a profound point and he's right, but it seems like with respect to number, 
the divine energy can be numerically identical and indiscernible, but yet the reference or the sources or the terms of the divine energy, energy can be distinct. So thus there can be a true synergistic activity between God and man in the one single divine energy of charity. But I as man and God are two distinct entities. So there can be unity in distinction with respect to the reference or the terms of this action of the divinity. And so I think this is what's going on. Insofar as the human nature and the divine nature of Christ are one, there is identity. But insofar as they are distinct, that is, human nature and divine nature, they're numerically distinct. You can, you can create a distinction and number one against the other. And so he has two natures. Thus, the Damascene asserts or believes that natures can be united qua hypostasis and yet divided without separation. The division comes in the nature, but the lack of separation is in virtue of the common hypostasis. And it is in how they are divided qua natures that determines their number. So they're divided according to nature, but united as hypostasis or person. Therefore, natures are numbered according to the difference between nature, and therefore the natures then fall under the category of discontinuous quantity. The natures aren't, in a sense, divisions marked on a line. No, they're actually really distinct and two separate discontinuous entities, and thus discontinuous quantities.